Yes, she was born in West Germany, but she was raised in East Germany. And then she went to study at the Karl Marx University in Leipzig. Yeah. Angela Merkel has all the hallmarks of a KGB agent. Ha, okay, okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> this is the clip. <laughs> Rapper, record executive and producer, Nata Beloy is a man with many fingers and many pies. Often described as a South African Sean Combs, he has a vision for South Africa that starts with the exposure of the youth to as much creativity as possible. We talk about cinema, why the replacement theory, and why Angela Merkel might just be a KGB agent. If you're enjoying the content, guys, please give us a like and a subscribe, and let's get a great conversation going on down below in the comments. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Nata Beloy. I actually didn't expect uh-huh. you to, to respond because, I mean, uh, we're a small podcast and you uh, seem to be the king of podcasts in uh, South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a strategy as to like how podcasts, especially in South Africa, uh, can assist us. Like um, in South Africa, we got, to, we got television too early, right? And uh, what people don't understand about that is that it killed, it stifled our movie industry because we didn't have enough cinemas. And also because all the cinemas were all in the minority areas, um, the white affluent areas, right? Yeah. We didn't actually have enough cinemas to service a movie industry for the whole entire South African population. And what that's done now is that all our actors, the only jobs they can actually get are on TV. And the TV jobs are not proper paying jobs. You know, you don't get um, three years worth of payment from being a starring character in a TV series. But if you do it in a blockbuster movie, you know, you've got enough money to not need to work again for another couple of years, which is something that Hollywood has, but we don't have. So um, because of the concentration um, of uh, our media as well, you know, and how powerful it is, um, there aren't other alternative monetization um, opportunities for any independent upstarts. And with podcasting, um, because it's still, you know, uh, relatively independent and because of the success that we've been able to have or well, that I've been able to have in my own business, which is a record company, using social media marketing, social media um, promotions and everything else, uh, we've been able to usurp the mainstream media um, in as much as like how the record industry is dependent on mainstream media in general. And um, that was uh, then um, used to catalyze, obviously, an emergence of different sounds, different genres, and everything else, which were uh, previously um, under the custodianship of the major record companies or the major record labels, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But now a whole number of independent record labels are able to produce a whole number of different kinds of music. And if you think about it like this, let's say you've got a record label, an example, there's one in the UK, which is close to you, Defected House, and their focus is house music, right? If that label is putting all their capital into producing more and more house music, but there's a new emerging genre called drill, in the streets of London, right? That is not going to get the resources that it needs to get the platform that it needs to get the promotion that it needs to become a monetizable mainstream genre in the future. And that is the challenge that we have with podcasting. If we allow it to become too concentrated, then what we're saying is that only prime media becomes the company that then decides whether Andy is able to have a podcast um, on Bruce Whitfield is able to have a podcast because he's on 702 and stuff like that. Yeah. So what I've been doing, it's not that I just I've made myself a podcast king or um, I get lots of views on YouTube, you know, um, uh, so it's very easy for any content that involves me to attract views. So I use that to basically empower independent, um, uh, what you call content creators, whether it be YouTubers, to get them to the monetization stage, which is 4,000 subscribers, to get them over the hump of 10,000 views for the first time, because I know automatically any content that I do will already have 10,000 views. And if that is achieved well enough, or if that mission is achieved well enough, there won't be enough, um, well, there will be too many podcasts for the corporations to buy by the time they start trying to buy up podcasts to silence everyone, which is what we've seen in America. It's already happened in America, um, and which is what I'm trying to prevent from happening in South Africa. That's awesome. Yeah, because that's what we sort of find as well is that starting off, um, it was easy at the beginning because there there was nobody in the space. You know, and then mm. as as it's become a, a thing that people have understood that it's okay, we can actually do this. Um, now it's being it's becoming so overpopulated that it's actually quite hard to find something that you want to listen to, and also your audience because the audience is so distracted by so many things. You know, and mm. when mm. when I discovered uh, Penwell, um, I discovered uh, like Black South African podcast because you know it just wasn't coming to my stream. And now all of a yeah, sudden, exactly. I've got like all of it on my stream. 
So it's um, it's fantastic because now I'd like, I like I find out about you and I find out about uh, just all these other people that are just talking about very different things to what I'm used to hearing, and it's just like it's amazing because your mind just expands instantly. But you have to be ready to look for it as well, you know, because there's no place to actually go and and find it. But then also it's like this whole punk ethos of just like doing it yourself, uh, building it, you know, build it and they will come sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but let's let's go back to you. Like um, your thing, you, you're uh, how would you describe it? Uh, a music industry uh, director. Yeah, right? well, yeah, well, I say that because I didn't want um, my actual profession to um, to allude to a criminal past that I don't have. I'm actually a rapper. <laughs> okay. That's actually what you should be calling me. You should call yeah. me a rapper because everything that I've done in business is because I wanted to be a rapper. And I needed to facilitate that by being a record executive so I could sign myself to my own record label, being a music producer so I could make my own music, you know, being a music promoter so I could promote uh, my own shows and book venues and, 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 and put on shows together. So I did all of that so that I could have a successful rap career. Um, but in doing all of that, it was much easier to then have someone else was doing the artistry while I was handling the business side of things. Right. And, um, and yeah, so, um, I'm a rapper, record executive, music producer, content creator. I've done everything when it comes yeah. to, uh, uh, music. I've shot music videos. I've shot viral videos. I've edited videos. I can use final cuts. I can, you know, use, um, I can use Adobe. Premiere Pro a bit, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not great at it, but I can use it. I can, I can, you know, I can do all of those things. So I've got uh, a whole number of skills and none of those skills I would have been able to get had I had a successful career in the music business in Europe or the United States, because those industries make so much money, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that they can pay people to do specific jobs and have specific disciplines. Whereas in South Africa, you know, you you, you can do like, anything. You know what I mean? You, yeah. yeah, jack of all trades. You know, you could be the record executive and the gaffer at the music video shoot. You know what I mean? Right. So you understand. And you need to have those skills. And that's why um, I think a lot of, of um, uh, production houses in the United States and in Europe a lot are hiring a lot of South African talent because they find that South African talent is very versatile. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was one of the things that sold me at the beginning when I came to Italy as an assistant. Uh, photographer. I, I could do anything. I wasn't scared of climbing up the tallest trees to hang a light or something. So because Italians are a little bit uh, scaredy cats of doing everything. So I was just yeah. like always hanging off something with electricity in the water. I didn't give a shit because, you know, I was used to that in, in Africa. Yeah, South like, African. And then you're like, like, yeah, you just do it. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah whatever. Bro. I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. I'm indestructible. But even if you die in South Africa, it's like, yeah, man. Yeah, like, well. my, my friend died. Yeah, I know he was like, you know, he's climbing something and taking photos. Yeah, yeah it's fine. What a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity. It's a pity. <laughs> But yeah, but it's like I've I've been um, drawing um, a lot of uh, similarities between Italy and, and South Africa because uh, when you say Europe, I would say England is like you were saying that um, everybody is very specialized and everything. But in Italy, unfortunately, the budgets are, are very different to <laughs> to France or yeah. or England. So we, well, so, yeah, Southern Europe. Yeah, is yeah, yeah. From yeah. We, we, we're like, yeah, we, we, we have issues <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> And so like, yeah. um, they, they, we, yeah, again, you're here, closer you to, to be... Malta than you are to England. Yeah. Or closer to Africa, as we say. <laughs> well, Malta, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Africa. <laughs> exactly. <Connected>. So, <laughs> and then again, the north of Italy is one thing. The south of Italy is another, you know, like it's very industrialized here where we are in Milan. And then you go to like Calabria, Sicily, and it's just like literally just like nature and tourism is the mm. thing there. But yeah, so so we have to sort of do our own things. My brother is uh, he's a skateboarder and he's the uh, creative director for MTV Europe here in, in Milan. Oh, dope. Yeah. Dope. So he, he also like you grew up like just doing things, making things. And then because he has the South African work ethic and he has this whole thing of um, just doing, you know, we have to edit something. Okay, I'll edit it because I don't want to explain to somebody else how to do it. He really just yeah. like climbed the, the the hierarchy and just got to the top now. Where, you know, so it's definitely something. The more you know, the more you can do, and the more you can tell people what needs to be done. No. Yeah, I mean, like what you're talking about. I mean, your your brother works at MTV, which is um, I don't know, maybe our part. Uh, might have crossed on an email chain or something because MTV Europe also mm -hmm. manage um, MTV so, yeah. Africa. For sure. Yeah. For well. Sure. Yeah. 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 So uh, maybe I'll pause across. But I mean, I experienced that when I went to go um, work at at Sony in um, in in New York, 
And I realized that uh, a lot of the staff, especially the lower level staff or in each of the um, different departments, right? Um, in each of the different departments uh, that, um, uh, that, you know, from a South African uh, background, you know, I've got much more experience in each of these different departments mm -hmm. than they have, you know, and I've got uh, vastly uh, more skills and more application uh, experience than they have. So, yeah, I can relate to that. So how do you think we can um, we can jumpstart like a, a movie industry in South Africa? What do you think is uh, is needed to like bring the Blumenkamps back to South Africa rather than making movies in Canada? Um, yeah. So w what we need are cinemas. Mm. We need cinemas in each and every single township. And we need to teach the kids um, that their imagination expands after they leave the cinema. You know, they get to tap into other children's imagination while they're inside the cinema. And then that should give them the confidence or embolden them to then be mm -hmm. imaginative themselves. So they too can see their own visions playing out on those big screens one day. And that needs to be the mission. It needs to be, we're getting the kids to cinema so they can fall in love with film so that we can find the next Martin Scorsese's out here. You know, we can find the next Quentin Tarantino's. And I'm using those two examples because I guess um, out of the most successful directors in the world, they're mm -hmm. the, less, the least, um, the least um, professionally trained, you know, yeah. uh, at their level of success. That's what I'm saying. I mean, trying, I don't think Tarantino even went to film school. Um, no, maybe a little bit, but yeah, not much. Yeah, but right now, yeah. but kids with TikToks, you know what I mean? They're not going to go to film school. They've got more chances of getting success with their little TikToks than they do in, in actually professionally shooting short films. If you take them to some place like the New York Film Academy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's not going to really work out as well. You won't be able to scale that um, uh, level of skills development that actually needs to um, take place within these communities, you know, and then they will then start having the confidence of telling their own stories because once they tell their stories and they can attract their audience to those same stories and they can start making content for different audiences with the confidence of knowing that, you know, their concepts are accepted and relatable to their broader community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, yeah, so the cinemas, yes, the cinemas build, build are the, the most infrastructure, important thing. you say, yeah. But, yeah, build the infrastructure, but also, I mean, the most important infrastructure is like this, it's like um, you're a rugby player, right? I can take all your practice moves and uh, put them on TikTok and everything else and you get a lot of views, but you're not really gonna make lots of money. The reason why rugby players make lots of money was when the Springboks are playing the 60,000 people at Ellis Park, mm -hmm. right? And therefore, Max Steel now wants to advertise and all these big brands want to advertise and there's a whole lot of money because these guys actually attract people, numbers, yeah. you know? And once we can attract numbers to the cinemas to watch our on-screen stars, then we raise their profile. And then our on-screen stars will stop attracting people to their TV, which is something that they're already struggling to do because people can't get their faces out of their phones and watching TikToks all day, you know? Um, then we can start getting them into cinemas and then we can start creating superstars out of these movie stars. That's what I was saying to my, um, a, fr a friend of mine. And I think I said this to you, I said, you know, I, I went on father's day, we went to watch Top Gear Maverick. And obviously, um, I'm not sure, uh, your folks are, are not with you guys in Italy, right? Uh, they're not with us anymore, unfortunately. But yeah, okay, yeah, no, unfortunately, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've got like memories of when you were younger, going yeah, to yeah. Movies. you know what I mean? So I, I don't know um, if Tom, did you ever watch Tom Cruise when you were alive? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to be a pilot because of that movie. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Same here. I spoke about S15 um, uh, jets as a kid all all day. All yeah. I would speak about. You understand? All I would speak about um, uh, would be F. Uh, 15 jets, fighter pilots, NASA, and everything else because of Top Gear, but also because I watched the movie with my dad, and it mm -hmm. was about the imagination, and obviously it was post Cold War, so the enemies are familiar to your dad because he's hearing about these things in the news, and then he has to explain to you, oh no, you know, oh, this is what's happening in Soviet Union, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, you know what I mean? And um, so that was an experience too. So now to do that again after all these many years, go back to watch Top Gear with my dad, who I've always watched the other top gears with, you know, um, that's because of Tom Cruise, because of yeah. the, the magnitude of the stardom of Tom Cruise. He brings me and my father to the cinema. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Um, so that's it. So we need to be able to create those generational talents of on-screen stars that bring people to the cinema. I mean, it's, it, I mean, John Gani is one of the most celebrated actors right now in South Africa, but most of his prestige comes from the Hollywood films that he does. You know, that's when we actually see him in the big screen. Mm -hmm. And that's because we are now paying money to go to the cinema to go and see him. 
Yeah. And that changes how we perceive his brand. And we need to start creating more and more of those brands who are ambassadors for our our cinematic experience um, as well, not just as actors, you know, mm-hmm. we're actually getting people into the film. So the Oscars and um, and the Academy uh, banned Will Smith um, from from the awards or whatever from for 10 years. And now you have to watch Will Smith on your iPhone. Yeah. Who, who loses? Oh, Will Smith, <laughs> for sure. No, and obviously, we, we lose, yeah. No, no, I'm I mean, like, like, <laughs> the, the cinemas are empty. The cinemas yeah. are empty. Uh, the, the lady that's making the popcorn is not making as much popcorn. You yeah. know what I mean? So she's working shorter shifts. She's getting paid less. You know what I mean? The, the woman that sweeps up the, each movie because there's less um, showings yeah, now. Yeah, but it's not, that, it's not that there's no more movie stars. There's just no more Will Smith. Yes. Because, because I'd rather watch Jamie Foxx than Will Smith anyway. That, that's fine, but would you rather watch Chris Rock than uh, uh, um, I don't know. Like, I, I don't, you see, I'm a big, big comedy fan. Huge comedy fan. So okay, yeah, for yeah. me, yes, no, 100% that. Chris Rock beats uh, Will Smith, uh, hands down. No, I, not only that, not only that, but also you are forgetting to explain that as a comedy fan, right, all the biggest comics, right, started rising before Will Smith did Independence Day. And yeah. after Independence Day, your Jamie Foxx, your Chris, as they were becoming, um, about to become movie Superstar. stars, Will Smith became the first black action hero oh, and wait, action wait, wait. movies. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, like, like because, in terms of like for me, mainstream. Like maybe you got Eddie Murphy, but he was doing comedy. So you, when, you, when yes. you broke it down into action, I was like, okay, cool, I'll give yeah. it to you. Maybe Denzel. And action. No, nah, he wasn't an action hero. Yeah, yes, he's yeah. a great actor. He does many things. He's not he's not typecast in terms of character, but he's not an action hero. Mm, mm, and yeah, action he's not was a really Tom becoming Cruise. big. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Tom Cruise was an action hero. Now you need to look at the nineties. The nineties was the era of the action heroes, the Schwarzenegger, the Jean Claude Van Damme, the Tom Cruise, the Will mm, Smith, mm, 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 right? And all your comedians, they don't fit into that frame. Of course not. So so your the way your perception of Will Smith as a superstar, he's anti the superstars that you actually like. Yeah. He, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Also, also like for me, that, that uh, the action that he did on the Oscar stage, like I get he's defending his woman, <laughs> but it, that's undefensible. No, no, no. Because that's, uh, simp, that's simp behavior. Exactly. You don't defend a woman like that. No, no, no. And then also, it's just a question of, um, you've, you know, there's this thing. I don't know if you follow Jordan Peterson at all. I do. Okay, I so do. he's always talking about the court jester, you know, the king and the court jester. And in that scene, it was exactly that because he was getting a prize for playing the king and there's the court jester taking the piss and the king couldn't take it. And so that's when he fell for me because you, 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 if you're going to be the king, if you're going to be the greatest action star, if you're going to be everything, you've got to be able to take a joke, mate. Yeah. And if your wife is angry about the joke, you talk about it when you get home, you sort it out afterwards, you give, I'm sure you yeah. can get Chris Rock's number and have a chat with him afterwards. And they already had beef anyway. So, so yeah. So, yeah. But just to like get back to the cinemas, like what's happened now after COVID here is there's been a huge resurgence of, um, of drive-in theaters. You know, people oh, yeah. are trying to like re get, get this back. And I remember, I can't remember the Feldskun. That was had, big. Yeah. yeah, we, yeah we, we had Feldskun back like in, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rockstone, Puerto Rico, also in Randburg, um, off of Malibongwe, which is um, DF Malan when you yeah. were down here. Yeah, just off of um, the highway. There was That's now right. it's, uh, it's apartment complexes. I of think course. it's more profitable. It's more profitable to sell Airbnbs for a night than it is. Hundred percent. But you, you've got rooftops. You've got uh, parks. You've got because you don't even have because once you had to have the um, the little speaker that you put on your car. Now you just have to have an AirPod. Okay, because then you can you can all go to a room, you can go to a space and have like a, a local local network. Everybody hooks up with their own speakers, their own uh, earphones. Ooh, it's like silent parties. Yeah, silent parties, exactly the same thing. You have the communal thing of everybody going to the same place and having a joel, but you don't have to have all the hardware of that you would need for a cinema, you know. And you can move oh it around. Gosh. You know, you can go no, to a parking you know space in four you know ways. You know what you could do. You know what you could do. You could have, you could have, um, you could have cinema tubes where people watch different screens and they've got headphones. And if you turn in a different direction, you hear the soundtrack from this screen. You turn also, in this direction, you hear the soundtrack. Also, but that, I, but that, that saying, takes away the um, uh, what you call the, the the communal uh, aspect of of going to the cinema or going to a the theater. 
You know, you go to the theater because you're all having the That's same true. experience, right? And then when the explosion happens, everybody's like, ha. Huh. Or when somebody laughs, everybody's laughing together. And even if you don't hear them laughing because you've got your earphones and you turn around, you've got your girlfriend, and she's got her, her, her mouth wide open, enjoying it. All the people around you are laughing. Uh, maybe you're sitting on your little plate, you've got your wine, you've got everything. It's, it will be an, a completely different thing. You could have, you know, like uh, food stands all the way around. And, um, you know, just like everybody's having whatever they want. You're a vegan. You can have your vegan stuff. You're, you want to have nah, hamburgers. Bro, Dude, you know we've what? got a business there's going. Let's do it. <laughs> it. Bro, there's a place called Altitude Lounge, right? It's now opened up in four ways. Four ways more. Remember where the Adventure Golf is? Uh, I don't think I ever saw the Adventure Golf, but I know four ways more. Okay. Yeah. Well, at the back of four ways more, there was an Adventure Golf. So now they've opened up like a day club. It's got a big screen. They usually watch games there. And I'm just thinking to myself, yes, we can party all day and everything else. But at night, we could actually watch movies. Yeah, we yeah. could actually premiere things on that big screen. And it doesn't need to be like the premiere, like the, the premiere of the latest uh, telenovela, which is a TV series, right? They could make like a premiere episode, which is made for viewing in cinema. So mm -hmm. that we launch this new program and then you watch the rest of the series. In fact, yeah. because already we're taking movies and we're breaking them down into series, right? Uh, yeah. As spin offs. Exactly. So, wow. Yeah. Actually, and you could wow. also, we, we, we've done, because um, I do music videos as well, and we've done premieres in, uh, in cinemas. You rent out the cinema for the. For the evening, yeah. you do the premiere there, you have the big show. It's, it's so awesome just to see it so big. Everybody's blown away by it. Everybody's tweeting it. Everybody's like Instagramming the event. And so it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's not complicated to do because the infrastructure is already there for all the concerts. I'm sure there's silent, silent parties in South Africa all the time. It's not mm. expensive because, I mean, it is mm. expensive, but it's, not, it's relatively cheap compared to building a cinema. And you can mm. start doing that. And then that's like, because then you can go straight into the township or you can do an event on top of, uh, I don't know, you know, like the mountain and you know, splashy fence. No, but, or, yeah, yeah, but I mean, but I think the township is the most important because the yeah. townships have got, have got the stories, they've got the, the talents, they've got the people um, that could be making uh, the content and that's where we need to inspire mm -hmm. them. Um, we shot a music video for an artist I work for. I don't know if you've checked it out, Questa Spirit. Yes, yes. I still love that movie. With Wallet. I watched it. it I've watched yeah. it five times already. It's so, so, so yeah. beautiful. Yes, well exactly. Done. So obviously we had a, a proper professional production. We were really going for it in that video. But what I really, what I really realized is that when we were going through the township and the, and the kids, they were seeing the film crew. They were seeing the lights, the rigging and everything. Like mm -hmm. it inspired them. I could see them saying, oh my goodness, this is what a, a music video should look like. And I was like, no, this is not what a music video should look like. Looks like. This is what a movie looks like. Yeah. We're shooting this music video like we'd be shooting a movie. This is like movie equipment, you know, that we've got here. Um, and really that, in, I mean, obviously uh, not as many people were uh, as fortunate as we were to be able to afford such a production. Mm -hmm. um, so we haven't seen subsequent productions like that. Um, we got lucky. Um, but um, I mean, just that inspiration and, and those kids knowing it's possible, who knows what it will yield, you know, in five to 10 years from now when they grow up. It puts a little seed, a little seed, because I mean, I, I, I grew up 100% more privileged, I think, than a kid growing up in the township. But still, I was mm. in Southport, Kuzulu Natal, small, tiny mm. little town in the middle of nowhere. Mm. I was just lucky that having Italian parents, uh, we always had this view of, towards Italy and towards, mm. um, you know, the art and all that kind of stuff that comes out of mm. there. So, um, my, my grandfather was an architect and an engineer and stuff. So like there was always oh, yeah. art in our house. And at one point yeah. I was just like, okay, cool. I can actually be a photographer, but still from Southport KZN, you didn't know like where to start, you know, <laughs> exactly. that's, that's what our other podcast is about. The arcade studio podcast is all about giving tools to people that don't know where to even start like how to begin, because it's not so much learning how to take a picture. That's easy. Everybody can do that. It's how yeah. to find clients. It's how to build your, um, your portfolio. It's and that's to, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the real part of it. And also when, when you, how to handle people, you know, when you're mm. on a set, you know, you, you know what it's like. You have to handle a th like 30 people that are doing 30 different things and make sure that mm. everybody's on ball. And, um, mm. and that's the hard part about, filmmaking photography music you know all that yeah. kind of stuff it's it's all and keep them motivated exactly them it's the management of it yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. and finding the money
Dude, you're, you're quite a controversial character. I don't know if we want to go into the controversy, but uh, I've, I've been no, seeing... No, I, it's up to you. No, I, like, no I, yeah. I, I, well, I, 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 I guess I did float this controversy a bit. You have some <laughs> strong ideas. Useful. Like my favorite one that I was... I mean, first of all, let me start with the things that we have 100% in common. Your love of philosophy. <laughs> Um, yeah. which I didn't study at school and I sort of had to discover it afterwards because I did photography school and that's actually uh, good, but it's a waste of time. you go to Vega. I didn't go to Vega or didn't go to like, I, I've discovered one thing. I went to thing. Vega and that's where I discovered my philosophy because we had a philosophy yeah. lecture at Vega. V Vega started in 2003 and I, was, I did the photographs of one of the first buildings that they, they put up in, uh, oh, nice. in Durban North somewhere. Um, oh, nice! And um, but that was already too late for me. I was already out of school by then. But um, the whole thing of like philosophy came in when I moved to Italy, and the, like I'm, my here in school they have it, you know, as a subject. So you're oh, like, yeah. okay, cool. One of the things is like study all of them from Marx to yeah. Engels and to Socrates, and yeah, and it's like yeah. So so that and and that is that is so important for a creative because it, it teaches you how to think about things laterally, you know, and mm. it's like the best thing. Strong self-study guy, you know? Yeah. Like just bettering yourself and, um, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So I think we got that 100% in common. Um, I was really interested, though, in, uh, in a comment that you made with Penwell that was like uh, about um, how uh, the, the African will take over the world because um, – your uh, melanin is stronger than ours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but, I'm all I mean, I'm down for that. But you're Italian. Yeah. yeah. But you're Italian. I've so got some melanin. Got mel <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you'd know that from Northern Europe, from Scandinavia, I mean, they suffer from melanoma because yeah. of sun exposure. Like, yeah. that's just a, a normal thing. Um, so uh, that people know about, you know what I mean? It's, it's mm. not really that controversial, but the, 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 the thing that makes it um, uh, uh, controversial to a lot of people is because you know all you see in the media is white supremacists, white supremacists, and you know my thing is this: that in this country, right in South Africa, right, we've got a minority of white South Africans. Mm -hmm. That type of content is coming from America, where they've got a majority of white Americans. You know what I mean? That type of content, right, can be insightful. Yeah. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You can't preach the same message against white supremacy in the States that you're preaching in South Africa because, of course. I mean, you could actually launch a genocide in South Africa. There's too few white people for, 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 it to be, for them to live like kings and allow the court jester to just have his way. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, it, it can represent a real threat. So the other thing that we, need, we then also need to do is because of the demonization on either side, we also need to take away some of the monstrosities that come with white supremacy, like uh, white supremacists, you know, um, subjugate black people. You know, you need to find creative ways to teach um, um, black people about certain things about them that, you know, give them advantages. Because to be quite honest, right, you're in Italy right now, right? Because, mm -hmm. um, yes, you can, in, coming from a white community, have certain privileges. But there's no such thing as white privilege in South Africa. And I'll explain that. That's a controversial point. I'll explain why. I'll explain why. Because if you were to, let's just per se, you wanted to start a business, right? And you want to sell socks. And you want to be the biggest sock company in South Africa. Who is your target customer? It's black South Africans. Of course. You understand what I'm saying? It has to so be. it has to be. That's the thing. You understand? So there is no advantage. Now, what is the disadvantage of a white person trying to sell socks to black South Africans? Is that there's a cultural gap. There's a cultural difference. And mm -hmm. therefore, you actually have no privilege in that regard. The person who's privileged is the black person who's got the cultural resonance. Now, of course. How, do we, how do we see this? You look at um, a guy, and it's generational, and uh, you know, I love the family as well. Both of them are great contributors to South African music. You look at Jesse Clegg. Now, Jesse Clegg is not a South African national treasure superstar. Why? Mm -hmm. Because his music resonates with a more of a European sound or Western sound, right? His father was a member of Juluga. The target audience was Black South Africans. Mm -hmm. And you know you explode. what Johnny Clegg represents. I mean, not, no, I'm, not, I'm saying that in Italy, Johnny Clegg is famous. Yeah, 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 100%. You understand what I'm saying? 
Mm-hmm. Jesse Click isn't. No, of course not. Yeah, course. But, and that yeah. and and that's that's the privilege that comes with um being um a black in Africa, in terms and, of dark skinned in Africa and culturally in Africa. And what 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 you're saying now is is probably you've hit the nail of why I'm doing these conversations because I want people white South Africans, hopefully, that see me mm. and mm-hmm. that they start interacting more with black culture, you know, mm. because there's still a strong separation of the two things. And I find it really retarded, you know, in all in all the, the, the meanings of that word, because mm. you need to we need to sort of build it together. You know, I need to understand you. You need to understand me. But as a minority, I need to understand you more than you have to understand me because you don't need me. I need you. You understand? Uh, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. But and and it's like and once you understand the the situation, then you can really like uh, build on it, and you can you know you can start using the situation in a certain, in a certain way. You know? Yeah. And using is maybe a terrible thing, word for it, but uh, you know, well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, I get what you're saying, but I think um, um, why you know. Um, it seems like you know, there would be some nefarious um, uh, or hidden intentions behind that, right? Is because we're not having the honest conversation about us actually being in the process of building a nation. Mm-mm-mm. You know, a hundred years. Uh, okay, let's, let, let me be exact, right? One hundred and twenty-five years ago, South Africa did not exist as a country. Mm-mm. You know, the Union of South Africa, I think, is 1910. So we've been building a country. Now, this country has different people inside it of different tribes, different um, uh, cultures. But we're trying to create a uniculture Mm-mm. that is a subculture of all our different cultures. That is a South African culture. And that is a non-racial culture. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So there are still people who are hell-bent on tribalism like still be in your tribe. I want to be a pure Zulu. I want to be a pure Africana or pure Dutch Africana. Uh, I, I want to maintain my French tribal um, ethnicity. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and that is what is dividing us is because we're not giving up where we come from to be a part of where we are going as a nation and mm-hmm. building uh, and fostering nationhood. And that is where we're finding a conflict uh, where there are people who are coming about one by one to foster and build this nationhood, right? And there's so much potential for this nationhood. It's just that we're sleeping on it because we are fearful of what it represents because, you know, um, I don't think we've ever seen an example of like a proper nationhood that is constructed no. on um, mutual compromise uh, like South Africa is. Um, and the reason I say that is because the only other democracy that we've actually been seen constructed in a recording of history from its inception up until where it is right now is the United States of America. And that did not come about as a result of a compromise. It came about as a result of a civil war. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And that civil war is still ensuing. You know, it was like, okay, let's end the actual, the exa- the violence of the civil war, but let's keep um, the, the, the passive aggressive battle of attrition going on. Um, and that's why you've got that whole entire duopoly um, yeah. structure of Democrats versus Republicans that are at a civil war with each other you know, in various number of ways without actually um, uh, shooting each other. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Is like, and also we got, we got left and right in South Africa. We got black and white. We've got mm. race, um, religion luckily doesn't play mm. too much of a mm. part of it at the moment. And so mm. we, we've got like so many factors that we have to, and then, and then we have all the tribalism stuff as well. So it's just like, it's almost about saying, okay, let's go into individuals rather than trying to get intersection, intersectional with it and being like, okay, you mm. got these five points, so you're there, and you got these five points, and you're there. If you go to everybody as an individual and everybody just decides what they want to do, then it's, it sort of becomes easier but more fragmented in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's easier but more fragmented, but the, as every individual, there's certain basic things that we mm-hmm. all want and, and desire. And if we start with those, the basics, and then we allow freedom for the individuality, you know, mm-hmm. um, as well, then we can create the rules of the no-nos that yeah. are not acceptable from any individual. And as long as each individual polices themselves from, you know, committing the no-nos um, exactly. that will make you a social pariah, then, you know, we should be fine. So is, do, you, do you think there is a, um, a willingness in the majority 
to to build this South African identity, or is it a thing that's that's being pushed at like a you know like an like a, on on the top level, but isn't actually filtering down, or or is it the, the opposite? Is it like a strong like a willingness and want to to actually build this thing? And then yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. I think South Africans love the idea of what South Africa could be, mm. and want to raise their children so that their grandchildren can inherit the South Africa that we've all envisaged it to be. You know what I mean? Um, all of us have got that dream. And I think there's no greater proof of that than the July unrest that happened um, last year. Um, and that's where ordinary South Africans said, we're not going to put up with any anarchists that are trying to yeah. you know, um, disturb our peace. We know as a country, we've got lots of issues, we've got lots of problems, but um, there are just certain people that want to take advantage of the divisions amongst us. And we need to show them that, listen, we, we are united. We just have disagreements, but we are united as South Africans. We've got a South African identity. We've got South African communities that we want to protect. And we will do whatever it takes to protect um, uh, those. Um, the saddest part, though, is that it proved that our government doesn't have that vision. <laughs> okay, you yeah. know, it's like <laughs> we're South Africa and the authority over how our lives live is the government. You know, because they're the administrative authority. Um, uh, uh, our lawmakers also they participate. You know, um, uh, uh, as a parliament, our judiciary also participate by policing um, that whole entire system. But in terms of um, each of those parties' commitment to the vision of South Africa, we've seen that they've been lacking. All of them. The judiciary is lacking in uh, in where its duties are required. The yeah. state is lacking in its administrative duties. And then parliament is also lacking at removing all the laws that need to be removed because, you know, we've got just too much regulation and also enacting the laws that will help us modernize. That's right. And then it's, it's almost like... It's almost like they they want to keep the chaos going because if they keep the chaos going, they're no, no, no. pile. No? It's not almost like they want. We have revealed now. We've seen it with our own eyes through that unrest that that is actually what they want to do. Mm-hmm. Because the July unrest was an ANC factional battle, yeah. you know, and the opposition parties said nothing. They just kept quiet because they are seeing the ANC self destruct. So it benefits them to watch this factional battle playing out while our country loses five hundred lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that for me was a moment of um, of hope, you know, because I saw how uh, I don't know my friends in Durban they all they mm. they all got into the streets, black, white, mm. Indian doesn't matter, mm. and they just defended their communities. Of course, the thing that breaks it down to a different divide, which is the social divide. So you got the poor and the rich, mm. you know, because that, that was very like obvious. The rich wanted to defend what they have, yeah. Exactly, of course, because you know, you want to defend your business, you want to defend your home, you want to defend your car, you want to, you know, so it was like all of a sudden, um, race wasn't a problem anymore, and so we got into social. <laughs> so we always have something that we have to sort out. And and, yeah. um, and the only way I see of, of that, that South Africa can sort that out is if we can somehow raise up like 40 million people. Because you're we're mm. what we're like 50, 60 million in South Africa, right? Yeah, 60 now. Yeah, 60. yeah I would say 20% yeah, is more or less you know, it's like 20, 20 million will be like affluent ish, and then mm. the rest are struggling now, I would say. Or is that as mm. well, those numbers a bit? Uh, yeah, well, I think maybe 10 million are affluent ish. Yeah, or, okay, or so less. I was, and then, I was optimistic. And then 50, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, there's a lot of people that are, are, are surviving, but looking like they're thriving, mm, mm, you know? Mm. And um, yeah, that's also uh, our over indebtedness as, as, as people, um, which is a problem that Zimbabweans don't have because they don't have credit. Right, of course. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, would, I would maybe not want to, ha- I'd rather have the, the credit problem and not have all the other problems that Zimbabwe has. <laughs> you know what? It's a trade off. There's trade-off. no solutions in life. <laughs> the, the blanket's always too short, it doesn't cover Yeah, everything. exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah, no, no. There's, there's just so many things, and I think uh, one of the, I don't know. In Italy, we have to bring another comparison. We, we had fascism here, right? So forever. And, and the funny yeah. thing about fascism uh, is that it, it, it was never seen in the same light as Nazism because we didn't, even though they did participate in some terrible things, it wasn't mm-hmm. doctrine. Like they didn't mm-hmm. have the hate for the Jews, and uh, the, it was just mm-hmm. we don't like other people, but we didn't ship them off mm-hmm. to. Um, to concentration yeah. camps and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So so a lot of people when fascism fell felt that they had a right to to keep supporting it. 
Yeah. yeah. Because it wasn't well, as, I mean, like, it wasn't no, so okay. bad. Okay, I, 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 uh, okay. I, I wouldn't say it wasn't so bad. I, no, no, I'm no. Not, uh, in their minds, yeah. in their minds. I'm not saying well, it wasn't bad. No, I, for me, look, I don't know if fascism is all bad. You understand what I'm saying? Mm, yeah. For me, for me, I think the problem is that eighty percent of fascism could work. Of course. The problem, the problem is that five percent that is evil, mm, mm, and that fifteen percent which is questionable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we're dismissing the entire eighty-five percent, which is manageable. I mean, or ninety-five percent, which yeah. is manageable, just because we can demonize Mussolini or we can demonize Adolf Hitler. Yeah, and but... then we now we now forget about what is their actual political ideology, and we forget about the ninety-five percent of things that are not pure evil. That they represent. But the, yeah, only that's way, the, the, the way I see it is that the only way to enact the eighty percent is that the, the other twenty percent exists. Like you yeah. can't you can't put it into practice, unfortunately. That's true. Without having like a psychopath in uh, in charge that basically takes all command to himself and just decides. Now, if you have a benevolent uh, dictator, which rarely happens, they usually benevolent for the first like five years, and then they sort of lose yeah. their minds because power corrupts. Yeah. So. Mm. You know, and then you start firing all the people that say no to you. Like what? I mean, Putin is pretty much that. You know, he's yeah. just, like said, fired everybody yeah. that says no, keeps all the yes men, yeah. and now you feel like you're a yeah. superhero. Or, or, or they just die of natural causes too early. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, for some reason, strange <laughs> enough. You know, that's exactly it. Or, or to, or like, um, like Gaddafi. Like he, I've always had like a sort of fascination with that man because he mm. was doing things in the in the African continent that I think would have would have been really, really positive for Africa in general. But guess what? Yeah. France wasn't a so happy. Called, <laughs> but a so-called, wait, a so-called, a so-called pseudo-fascist was the one who was supporting him. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Berlusconi was his, yeah. his biggest ally. You know what I mean? And Berlusconi was the one who told him to run when yeah. NATO started coming from me. You know what I mean? They, Berlusconi tried to give him early warning. And, and I think his last phone call, um, to any leaders who were same telling Berlusconi, you betrayed me, you betrayed me, you betrayed me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, those are some of the word, last words um, Gaddafi said. Um, so, you know, my thing is that you're right. There's a whole lot of bad parts about fascism, right? But I feel like the way it's over-demonized, we are, we are failing to critically analyze that era in what? Italian history. Yeah, 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 for sure, 100%. And I think... And, that... and, and, yeah, with, with and, then, our, and, and our, that stops us from, you from that stops us from being able to know which mistakes we will repeat because mm. we're not looking um, critically enough at that history. Exactly, exactly, and that that's that's pretty much the point that I was trying to make is that uh, now uh, the grandparents, which are the people that were pretty much grown up in the fascist twenty years, you know, my grandmother's mm. almost a hundred now, and she was sixteen mm. during the Second World War. Oh yeah, so she came up. All her her youth, she was indoctrinated. She went to all the youth camps. She she wore the uniform. You know, my great grandfather was obviously a fascist because you had to be a fascist, otherwise you wouldn't work. Mm. You know, had a hotel, mm. um, and so she, she saw she did bring through a lot of her like positive fascist ideas <laughs> through mm. to, through to her children and to the grandchildren, which are us. Mm. So like. And and when I say that, it's like a, I'm not fascist, but I want to yeah. say <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> because but otherwise you come you, you come from people who lived in an, who, in an who era where, fasc where fascism was necessary. Exactly, exactly. So so then now what's happening is that these grandparents are falling away. Their children are getting older, so and they will sooner or later fall away, and it'll will forget what fascism really was. You know, in general, mm. like the bad and the good and, and everything. Mm. Um, and maybe then we can start looking at it, you know, mm. critically. Because we don't have, because it's almost a problem having the first person accounts. Because someone will be like, oh, it was, everything was amazing. And the other people will be, oh, it was all shit, you know. Mm. And I think it's the same thing. That and it's the, the, the persecution that happens to people that were either the, the protagonists or whatever. As yeah, well, exactly. While they're still alive, you know. Exactly. So, like, you, th that'll fall away, hopefully. And I think, we, I, well, I don't want it to be relived because I, I doubt, I'm, I doubt very strongly that we can, we can handle a good fascist state. I don't think it'll. It's a bit like communism. It's a fantastic mm. 
thing on paper, you put it into practice, people have to exist. So if, as long as mm. there are people, uh, something that is holy Christianity, Christian can't work, something that's holy Islamic couldn't work, something that's holy uh, communist mm. or fascist, it just doesn't. It has to be, like we were saying yeah. earlier, a compromise, a melding, taking the good parts from everything, taking the bad parts from everything. So I, so I just think your, your, your... audio has gone again. Yeah, yeah. Is that better you now? Know, but you said it. You said it's like, yeah, yeah, perfect. Ah, uh, I oh know. I've got. I've lost uh, my train of thought there. Um, but uh, anyway, let's just. Uh, I was just saying. So you were talking it, about us compromising and taking. Yeah, the yeah. Good you have to it. compromise and just take the the good parts from where you can, uh, and like you were saying that, that that it's just like it needs to become a thing that. But unfortunately, for the right. Communism is is instantly bad for the left. Anything that smells of fascism is instantly bad, and you can't have a conversation about it. And for me, that that is a tragedy, because mm -hmm. you know, um, especially uh, now, uh, within especially African communities, um, well, Black African communities, right? Um, there's a lot. Bad news. <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry about that. I don't know. So, someone was just calling me, and it took over the screen. So there's a lot that's happening with uh, uh, within the world, right? That we are unable to actually critically analyze or study because some of it, you know, um, has been demonized. You know, we can't critically analyze um, um, uh, the Nationalist Socialist Party of Germany. Right, mm -hmm. even though uh, the Christian Socialist Democrats are basically, I mean, similar so, ideology. <laughs> you yeah. understand what I'm saying? Um, but now we're seeing it play out in the political double speak and the subterfuge. I mean, like, if you were watching Angela Merkel's um, whole in chancellorship of Germany, you'd think that her and 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 and, and Putin are sworn enemies just in their public statements mm -hmm. together with each other. But I just want to put it to you like this, right? Um, would your enemy now, knowing that you are afraid of dogs, um, have you have a press conference where they bring like an Alsatian there? Well, yes. No, they, no, they wouldn't. <laughs> it's, it's an because you guys, it's it's an enemy. So like, why would an enemy need to do that? You guys are already enemies. They don't need to do that. But your brother, right, who's your friend and buddy, and who knows you're afraid of dogs, right, and does it as a prank, uh, just I to don't cut know. you out. I don't know. Well, I, I don't know I, if I, I'm, I'm going to push back on that because I think if, if I'm going to have a conversation with somebody that uh, I want to dominate, I'm going to pull out all the stops to try and dominate that person. So if I can make somebody uncomfortable by introducing a dog into the situation, or I don't know, someone's afraid of tomatoes and you have tomato salad, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's if you look at that flexing. incident in isolation. That's if you look at that incident in isolation, right? That if you look yeah. at that incident, I, well, I would that say the stronger thing to the, is that the fact that they have they have two pipelines from Russia. To... Um, I, I lost you again. I lost you again. I oh, don't know. for fuck's sake! There we go. Is that better? I've got this dodgy yeah, yeah. connection. Yeah, so 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 yes, that's exactly my point. So mm -hmm. if you look at all the public statements between Putin and Angela Merkel, they speak negatively of one another, mm -mm -mm. but they've got two pipelines that are connecting to each other. They've shut down the nuclear plants in Germany. Germany's economy is dependent on 40% of its um, uh, energy production coming from oh. cheap Russian gas, right? Yeah. Um, it's, it's just, it's industry. I'm not just talking about all energy consumption. No, no, like, all um, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So things like that. And then there's this simple effect that yes, she was born in West Germany, but she was raised in East Germany. And then she went to study at the Karl Marx University in Leipzig. Yeah, Angela Merkel has all the hallmarks of a KGB agent. Ha! Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying. Th this is the clip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. So if you if you if you look at the situation right now, right, and you think to yourself, okay, fine. If I'm a KGB operative, and I know that, okay, we've got the Eastern Bloc of Germany, mm -hmm. right? So we've got yeah. this side of things, right? What can I do? Right to ensure that we take all of Germany, even the Western part. The yeah. best thing to do is right is to surrender the fight first, and let the enemy overextend themselves. Yeah, right. Which is what Russia does. Too boisterous. 
So they, they, they collapsed the Soviet Union first, and then America said, ah, oh, liberal hegemony. And then they started bombing everybody. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And they got themselves into wars. They can't get themselves out of. There's people falling out of planes in Afghanistan and all those types of scenes, right, that we're seeing now as the American empire starts to crumble because of its over-expensiveness and because it's just got too much um, to manage. Mm-hmm. Um, and it needs to start being more nationalistic because even the population is less... Um, willing to keep voting in leaders who are going to be meddling in other people's issues instead of focusing on making sure that they can afford milk. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, 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 so when 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 I analyze that whole entire part, I I feel like you know the Soviet Union, in some way, actually succeeded because if you look at the production of the world, right, it comes from a former Soviet ally, mm-hmm. China. You yeah. know what I mean. Um, Vietnam as well. Obviously, it was split into North and South uh, Vietnam, um, but the production is happening. You know what I mean? The Americans lost the war in Vietnam um, um, to the Viet Cong, um, and 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 beyond that, right? Um, if you look at uh, 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 Europe itself and how dependent it is on re- cheap resources from Russia as well, or from for- former Soviet Union states, or you know the borderline states are the ones that are now needing to transport um, and transfer resources around the rest of Europe to uh, 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 reach the other um, uh, 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 Western European nations. Um, you know. For me, just looking at it, like historically, it seems like um, um, East Germany won, you know, right? And it won, it, it won by uh, in a in in a game of 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 um, I don't know, um, chess. I guess, yes, I guess they, they they played better chess. You know, it was a, a queen sacrifice when they mm-hmm. collapsed the the you know they they sacrificed their queen. They collapsed the Soviet Union. You know, um, uh, they focused on building Mother Russia um, as well and giving it a, a stronger nationalist identity and also building up um, the nationalist identities of all the smaller Soviet states um, in the periphery. And um, that seems to be, have been a successful um, uh, project. Um, just that now, obviously, this war in Ukraine, you know, um, is, you know, the human casualty element of it is not consistent with modernity mm, you know yeah, we wage war without having to kill people these days um so the fact that people are still being killed now in this war is like you know it's a very rudimentary form of war but i mean it's not the only place that there's war being waged um in the world yeah the at the same the, time though the, at the same the, time the, though you go for it go for it yeah sorry but at the same time though um there's been more people killed in the first six months of um of 2020 in South Africa than there have been um, throughout the war in Ukraine. And that violence, well, okay, let me just, I'm going to put a pin in that because I'm going to come back to that. But uh, I think that the reason that the Ukraine war is, is getting so much news rather than Yemen or Somalia or that is that not because the only reason is money. It's, 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 yeah. it's you know, it's putting an entire continent where, I'd say 50% of all the content and uh, and uh, money is flowing from, so the whole of Europe. I mean, in Italy, we, we're spending four times more for gas this winter, which is a lot of mm. money, because if you're spending 1,000 euros uh, a year, now you're going to be spending 4,000 euros a year. I mean, and when you're spending on gas, you're going to be spending on what you're heating with it. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's food, it's it's heating. Um, we're just going to run cold this year my, in my family, that's for sure. We're just going to wear an extra jersey. <laughs> because I mean, it's, it's Seriously? Of, yeah, because because four grand, I mean, that's like uh, a month's salary, basically. That just goes out there. Yeah, it is. Just for heating. So uh, we'll just have to just suck it up a little bit. But, um, but I wanted to go back to, you were talking about how Russia sort of gets plays a long game and it, there's a fantastic mm. fantastic series called revolutions i can't remember the name of the of the writer but it's on um it's on apple podcasts and he talks about all the revolutions from the english revolution mm. mexican uh cuban all of them to the russian the russian is the last it one he does. dude it's amazing i think you'll really enjoy it if you enjoy history and uh, strategy it's amazing and the mm. first 20 episodes so it's about each episode is about half an hour. So the first 10 hours. <laughs> it's like um, history with Stephen Kotkin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or hardcore history with Mike, uh, with Carol. Um, and it's, yeah. it's so good. 
but the first 10, 10 or 20 episodes is just about the groundwork set by the communists in Russia and how long it took from Marx to the revolution, which is like, I don't know, 30 years or something like that, and maybe more. And it was just like how they sort of started putting teachers into place in the little towns, you know, it started impl imp like putting in ideas and the same sort of thing. There's actually a, a KGB agent that's been, that was um, discovered in the early nineties or late eighties. And he was saying, we're doing exactly that thing in, in the States. You know, mm. we're in, we're embedding our ideas in your children, mm. you know, mm. and then exactly. by the time that, that those children will be grown up. Oh, sorry, dude, everybody's going to be speaking Russian. So, <laughs> mm. yeah. So that's, uh, I think that's, Gonna, that they play a very good long game. They're not scared of suffering. They're not scared of, of killing millions of their own people to, to get to a goal. You know, the Russians, yeah. really, you know, they never, you know, First World War, they just threw people at it. Second World War, they just threw people at it. You know, here's one gun, yeah. two people, go for it, you shoot, you carry the bullets. You know, so they're not yeah. scared about, about decimating their population too. And that's well, a big, I mean, look, uh, they, yeah, the, the British Empire, I mean, they're 44 years from a thousand years since yeah. uh, William the Conqueror, right? So, like, they're a 900-year-old, 950-year-old family, um, whereas the Russians are, are, are significantly older, um, mm -hmm. you know? Um, just if we look at the, the origins of the Orthodox Church on its own, I mean, that's part of the Russian Empire, and that's mm -hmm. many millennia old, you know? Um, so, you're talking about uh, at the times where the Romans, um, still um, uh, ran Egypt, you know? So that's back then. I mean, people who had engagements with the peak of the Ottoman Empire, you know, it was right up against, mm -hmm. you know, the only thing that defended the Ottoman Empire from expanding to Europe is the Black Forest and 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 maybe weather. Um, uh, <laughs> you no, know, no. so, yeah. So, I, I mean, that civilization has been around for such a long time. And I, I learned this in a conversation I was having with another friend of mine, you know, and he grew up in, number one, um, his mother was raped. Mm -hmm. And that's how he was conceived, right? And he grew up in Kailicha, no, in Nyanga, in Nyanga Township, which is one of the murder capitals um, of South Africa, you know, um, uh, just the Cape Flats as a whole, you know, and all those townships uh, in the surrounds um, are very violent backgrounds to come from. And what I found is that, you know, um, we are exactly the same age. He was born in 1990, I was born in 1990, we're both 32 years old. But the mere fact that um, I, I know, sorry about that, I don't know, no I think, yeah. So I know my grandfathers for 13 generations, right? Uh, oh, oh, no, 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 I know my, my, my grandfathers Right, I'm generation thirteen from my grandfathers. So my uh, my dad, uh, there's twelve generations before him, and then uh, from my grandfather on, there's eleven generations um, going up. Right, and I know all their names. Right, mm -hmm. and um, we sing songs about them. You know, we, we, there's certain songs that they composed. My great grandfathers uh, composed that we still sing um, today. That are part of our family history. Right, and that's how we learn about their lives through the songs that they composed about their lives. Um, he doesn't have that at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it's like I am not, uh, I, I'm not fluent in my mother tongue, which is Shitsonga, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, but my language is just a language. And yes, it helps me connect with the stories of our past, right? It helps me connect with our history um, as Tsonga people because I understand the language, right? Um, but my lack of uh, uh, fluency in speaking the language does not make me miss out in any of the understanding and the meaning, right? And, but that's just a language. A language is just a language, it's a technology. Without mm -hmm. the culture, without my family history, you know what I mean? And knowing the genealogy of my family and everything else, I lose my actual roots and my culture, you know? So I could speak fluent English, but I know my culture to the T, mm -hmm. you know? And I know my history to the T, and that's what I have. So you extrapolate that, into nations and civilizations that have been around for you know millennia and um and how they think how they process it you know you're looking at this war in ukraine it's just a blip in the history of, of course, it all. Nothing. and if you look at it if you look at it and in, in terms of um, putin's tenure you know the duration of this war is going to constitute less than five percent of his total tenure at the helm 
you know, in Russia, you yeah. know, uh, uh, you know, eventually, because I don't see him um, stepping down uh, ever. No, me neither. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think it's possible for him. And I, I, yeah, he's just got too many enemies to ever step down. Um, so he's painted himself into the, uh, the president for life um, corner, you know, and I see Xi Jinping etching in that way. And, you know, it's not the best way to go out. You, you never want to um, um, uh, hold on to power past your popularity. Um, but we'll see how, how that works out, you know, after this war, uh, whether the, the popularity stakes, whether um, he still uh, has resounding support of the Russian people. Um, but again, you can see that they're playing a long game. They're not playing 100%. for now, you know, and they're not playing for a short or uh, um, eight year, two terms, presidential term, uh, so they can build a library and on themselves forever, mm -hmm. which is the American way of doing things. And um, that also brings me to my other point about, you know, the failings of a democracy and the loss of monarchies um, also not being good for civilization going forward because we, we lose a lot of institutional knowledge with the changing of political um, managers that we put in place, you know? And um, we also lose an incentive for someone to ensure that the work that they're doing right now, they can uh, get to benefits or enjoy the benefits of the praise thereof when they're no longer able to do anything about it. So mm -hmm. Your, your your grandmother, right, knew that at a certain point in time, you know, she wouldn't be able to do anything about her children, her grandchildren and everything else. And they would need to respect her and love her for everything she did while she was able to be active. You know, and the same thing works with kingdoms. You know, um, King Charles um, will leave the throne to his children and they will inherit um, um, the prestige um, that he has brought to the crown through his tenure. Or they will inherit, you know, uh, the the destruction. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. thereof. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's up to him. And yeah. if they inherit the destruction thereof, then you know that whole entire family can then be removed, and we find another royal family mm -hmm. that can then take on that responsibility, knowing that the consequences are death. Yeah. So we we voted in Italy for um uh to we had a referendum after the war whether to keep our uh, royal family or go to a presidential system. You know, like, so, and and after the war, because the um, the king had supported Mussolini, obviously they they kicked him out. He had to go to exile. But I agree with you that to maybe like a um, a constitutional monarchy, like they have in in Spain or in uh, or in England, um, is very much more useful than what we have in Italy because we have to vote for um, for a president every I don't remember five years or six years or something like that. And and it's always like the oldest person that we can find in the Senate. You know, somebody that's done mm. something, you know, and it's always people that were like trying to be prime minister and uh, maybe never did it, never managed to do it. But Lusconi wants to be president, but I don't think he's going to get it. And they put him in this position mm. where it's powerless, but also they it's have, ceremonial. It's ceremonial, but it also has no weight except for mm. what the person has done in his life. It doesn't have mm. the weight of the family, like, you know, Princess mm. you know, Queen Elizabeth. Was Queen Elizabeth II? Her great grandmother mm. was Queen Elizabeth mm. I, you know, mm. or Queen Victoria. And um, mm. so there's all that story that comes through that and pomp and ceremony. I mean, you saw when the funeral came along, you know, that was yeah. like that was Britain saying, look, yeah. we, we exist. This is what Britannia, we are. great. That Britannia. was Britannia. Rule Britannia. Yeah. Absolutely. And as much as, you know, maybe um, they've, they've wrought damage or, across the world, they've also you know, like fascism, probably done some things that are useful. And, um, yeah. and so it's just a well, matter of... Well, wait, wait. That's yeah, the thing there we that go. You... That's... <laughs> gotcha. No, my thing is that... Is that, is that you know, well, look, I, I think the thing is that we say things and we, we forget how powerful language is because mm. it's very easy for us because obviously you're Italian, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? And uh, now neutral. we're criticizing the... You're neutral, so we can criticize the British, right? So when we're criticizing the British, because neither of us are British, we say they brought destruction into the world. They weren't bringing destruction into the world. You know, they were. They brought destruction to the enemies at the time. Yeah. Because at the exactly. time, in that world, those were the enemies. We, we weren't in a globalized world where you see people from other places as fellow human beings. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, we need to look at history um, through um, yeah. that context as and well. We, we need to be careful because... There's a new generation that's coming about and they're learning of these things 
from us, right? Mm -hmm. We are the first like literate generation where just in general, the population is literate. You exactly. know what I mean? Uh, you'd have more literate people than illiterate people, which wasn't the case a hundred years ago where there were mostly illiterate people. Um, I mean, like anyone in Sicily, why would you be a Sicilian? A no, hundred years ago, nobody wrote a book or read a book. Yeah, you understand, you understand what I'm saying? So that's the whole entire thing. I mean, you'd have to go to Milan. Mm -hmm. and, and go get taught in Milano. And yeah. you have to come from an elite family where you could be rich enough to go to university because going to university meant sacrificing getting a job that can support you. And yes. as an adult, where you need to be able to support yourself. So only the, the children of the rich um, um, uh, went to university. I say this to my sister all the time, you know, um, because, you know, she, she has a struggle um, because she's a black woman and because the media keeps telling her that she's some sort of victim. You know what I mean? Um, because mm -hmm. she's a black woman, right? I say... My sister, you got a PhD at 35 years old. You got a PhD at the London School of Economics, SOAS, you know, um, at 35 years old, only because your dad is rich. Mm, 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 mm. And I'm not saying that your dad has got lots of money, but like if you look at it effectively, like your dad actually has to be rich for him to be, make sure that his daughter can study all the way to a point where she's unmarriable. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. Because, I mean, here we got a similar sort of problem with uh, people being overqualified in just general. But here mm. it's because um, university is free. Yeah. And, and there's no time limit as to. Yeah. Like, you, you can literally just. If, you, if you're from a low income household, you have free studies. If you come from a higher income household, you pay something. But it's like maybe two grand a year maybe mm. so it's it's like it's mm. doable for any family and people are like are they they're getting two three degrees without any problems okay mm. and that, that that leads to over qualification both on men and women and um, yeah yeah but uh, you you brought back to the point that you know we are a generation that is completely different to three generations ago and 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 as the the older generations are dying off they're going to leave something but we can push our countries onto the new way. And South Africa and Italy aren't that different as far as age goes, because Italy was was unified in 1890. Yeah, you know, Before exactly. it was just city-states. And I mean, we have yeah. the Roman Empire, so we, we build on that as our, um, as our history going yeah. back and whatnot. But Italy as a whole, I mean, that's why the South and the North hate each other, because the South was Spanish and Bourbon, and the North was more like Germanic as a sort yeah, of... Yeah, exactly. You know, so... Yeah, so we got we got the, the issues. The more I speak to people about it, the more I realize that Italy and South Africa. If we if we had a black and white problem, we'd be the same country. Mm. Yeah, not, so, not to say uh, that we don't, but we do. But, no, no, <laughs> but yeah, but, but that's the thing, and that's what we need to be able to eliminate because this black and white problem is the biggest problem that the world has because we're so focused on it um, that it's stopping us from attending to anything else, and also it's being used to 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 create other differences. Because obviously this black and white problem has now been used to now create new, oh, uh, uh, we've got um, transphobia, mm -hmm. which is the new racism, you know, yeah. which is worse than racism, uh, actually transphobia now, because I mean, there's worse consequences for transphobia. And then there's Asian hate, um, which is a new thing that they now create. Um, and you're thinking to yourself, I mean, when has it ever been um, that Asian people as a whole have been subjugated the same way black people were. So you cannot analogize this new pseudo-Asian hate that stems from the fact that, you know, um, all the um, gain-of-function research is happening in China and Italy as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, uh, I mean, that was the Chinese and Italian connection. That's why Italy, you know, the COVID cases we were the first started because, mm -hmm. because you guys built the labs. Mm -hmm. in Wuhan. We're very Those good at building labs. <laughs> so, so, you know, you guys built the labs in Wuhan because um, Barack Obama uh, said no NATO nation is allowed to have a gain-of-function um, offensive research. It can only be done defensively. Mm -hmm. um, so it was done in, in, in very limited... So basically, you can make vaccines for yep. pathogens, right? But you have to go to a place where you have to actually make those pathogens for offensive gain of function research, which is China. Of so, um, so th that is um, uh, uh, the the way in which, like right now, you can say that you know 
if we were able to overlook the black and white problem, those don't exist when we're dealing with uh, biochemical uh, weapons mm-hmm. um, uh, or viruses that are man-made, etc. You know what I mean? They kill uh, black people, they kill white people. They might kill um, different um, communities uh, disproportionately based on their lifestyles and um, uh, their health status um, from a class breakdown. Um, it does happen. But I mean, like in general, we were all negatively affected. All our economies were negatively affected. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and no one came out of this unscathed except for, you know, uh, the pharmaceutical companies who made yeah. um, billions in profits yeah, and not, trillions was, still to was, come. They're going to just keep coining it. And I think that's the, not now that it's coming out more and more how, how lax they were in the testing of it. I mean, the other mm-hmm. day they were talking about um, to somebody from Pfizer, Pfizer Europe, and they're like, oh, no, we didn't test for um, for transmittability. Effectiveness. Yeah. yeah. We were like, no, we, like, we'll, we'll figure it out afterwards. We, I mean, it, it stops in theory, but it doesn't, like, we don't know if it's going to not transmit it. And they sold it to us as if it was 100% going to block all transmission. And it's like, as soon yeah. as you, because, I mean, I had to get vaccinated, but I didn't want to get yeah, vaccinated. Yeah, because you traveled. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because, no, no, all for, of us. All South Africans, had, if you're in South Africa, you had to get vaccinated even if you didn't want to, because travel restrictions were mm. so bad on us. Yeah, also, apart from the travel restrictions, I, to go on a set, you, either you had mm. to do a, a test every single day or you had to get vaccinated. So, and we're getting tests and being vaccinated. So I was like, well, so why am, I getting, <laughs> why, why am I getting vaccinated if I have to do the test anyway? But anyway, it doesn't matter because obviously you become a social pariah. Oh, to drop off my kid at school, I had to have the, the COVID passport. Otherwise, I couldn't mm. drop her off. I couldn't go inside the school to drop my kid at school. And I had to go inside because she's four years old. So I have to actually take her inside. I can't drop her off outside. So I had to get vaccinated. Vaccine. Otherwise, I couldn't take my child to school. You know? So that's the thing. And then we get forced into this vaccination. And we don't even know what's going on. Um, and the people that are behind um, um, the vaccination, the people that are behind the, the lax testing, you're looking at Lancet, that's Peter Dajic. Yeah. Peter Dajic um, and Lancet are 50% partners in EcoHealth, which um, uh, Bill Gates is also a part of. EcoHealth are the people that did the data function research, the people that funded the labs that were in Italy um, and that, that were moved to Wuhan, where the Wuhan Virology Center yeah. was. And then if you look at a country like South Africa, we're the only country in Africa where um, we can actually do grain of function research because we've got the CRISPR labs down in KZN. And then guess what happens? We also Omicron. become the country where, <laughs> and it comes from where? Yeah. Where? <laughs> from South I was, Africa. <laughs> I was in South Africa. I finally, after two years of no travel, no nothing, I was like, okay, this November, we're going to go down to South Africa. Land on the 23rd of November, on the 26th of November, Omicron pops up. Luckily, <laughs> I was flying with Ethiopian Airlines, and Ethiopia doesn't give a shit about who's got <laughs> Omicron or not. And yeah. that, so our flights were fine, and I didn't stress at all. And I saw Cape Town was buzzing everybody was stoked to be out of doors finally and in pubs and bars yeah. so for i was yeah. like calling my friends in, in in back in italy and being like guys don't stress it's like nothing this is like gonna be you know we've yeah. sorted out the problem south africa has once again <laughs> pulled out all that's the a, problem that's what we then, do and then, the south and africa then, sorts then, out everybody's problems and nobody says that, thank you well, I don't think we can we can really be thankful because I mean the person who's behind um, uh, uh, the announcement that Omicron acts as somewhat of a vaccine or an inoculation um, mechanism, um, even though it infects you with the COVID virus, is Bill Gates, mm. the co-owner of Eco Health, and he says that when he's in Germany to say, hey, well, you know, we weren't able to force everybody to take this vaccine, um, but we might not need to because we've got Omicron, which is just as effective. Because so w- would you say cell, then that maybe... T-cell immunity. <laughs> so Bill Gates worked with our labs in South Africa to just to develop a, a to create, virus... To create Omicron, yes. That will go, okay, okay, I like that. I hadn't which, thought is about a, that. which is a least power, which is a less powerful strain, yeah. right, uh, of... of uh, uh, the COVID virus. And also, we know that there was no um, m- mutation mm-hmm. from the original COVID to Omicron as well, again. And then we That's... also have not seen, been able to find the root virus. You know, the genome yeah, that was yeah, sequenced yeah. In, 20, in 2013, 
right before they ended the gain of function research legally in NATO nations, which is a decree that was signed um, by yeah. uh, Barack Obama, it was identified. It's still the same genome, right? And has been the same genome the whole entire time and is maintained and yet was able to create a, a new so-called mutation mm-hmm. which has got no actual roots or linkages to any of the previous variants. And there is you strangely know. another lab. Dude, I get so angry about this because dur- right during the lockdowns, um, I reached out to a friend of mine in Miami. He mm. works for a mm. uh, genetics lab where one of the prominent Italian virologists mm. works. So he's with him. He works mm. in AI, but he's well-versed. He's a scientist. Mm. So I was like, and, and he came out with a video on Facebook of why this is 100% not lab leak. Okay. Mm. And it's like, it's definitely came out the web market. He, he spoke about it. So I had him on, we spoke about it. Obviously that it was right in the middle of all the shit storms. So that, that video got throttled completely by YouTube. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, we have quite a few views usually and that was there, it went like 20, 30 views max. It was completely <laughs> like blacklisted. Yeah. But, that's because you didn't say that, that's because you didn't speak Italian throughout the whole thing. You should have done that. No, no, it was Italian. Like... No, no, it was Italian. We, oh, did you speak in Italian? Yeah, yeah it was Italian. It was Italian. Oh, oh no, no, no. I, well, YouTube is powerful. Which means, well, I mean, Spanish and English, yes. Yeah. Very much so. But I never knew that they were also that strong on Italian. Mm-hmm. Because I also watch a lot of Italian content that are subtitles because, you know, right. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> a no, lot it, more it, Italian it, content filters through. It was 100%, 100% um, blocked up. But anyway, and, and he was like adamant. It's like 100%, these are why. And I was like, dude, how can you be so sure? It's like, we only just discovered this. No, 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 that's how it is. And now, like, I know if, that if, if I go to him and be like, dude, so what do you think? He'll be like, oh, you know, we just didn't have all the information. And so I was sure. And that's it. I'm like, but that's not science, is it? Being sure isn't science. So when mm. you want me to believe the science and you say I'm sure, I get very scared worried now because you just told me you were sure about something that wasn't true and then i'll be but like science is about hypo- hypothesizing exactly it's a hypothesis it's never about being sure it's always about hypothesizing That's what until you prove i mean gravity we can all be sure that uh, we know what gravity is we can put it into work we, i mean if someday mm. something comes out that explains to us a bit more what gravity is it's not going to change what gravity does to us and what the things that we make with gravity you know, like mm. all the calculations and whatnot. Mm, so exactly. it, it's not going to change it by knowing more about it. Okay. Whereas, exactly. so we can be secure in knowing what gravity is. And, yeah. and, and that, so that's a science and evolution. We sort of figured out that, okay, we can see it in, in, in function. But when you come to me and you say something that's sure that you've only seen for like 20 minutes, dude, come on, really? Mm. And then you'd wonder why people don't trust scientists anymore. It's it, like, you understand? Uh, and I want to and trust scientists is, because I, that's what I want what, to do. <laughs> but exactly. So now the whole entire field of science being called into question is also a very dangerous thing. Um, because a lot of our cultural, or a lot of our culture is based on uh, a, a progress that we've had scientifically. Of course. Um, you know? Um, so that is something that is also very concerning for me. But I think um, the most concerning thing for me, just in general, is that um, you know there's a growing desperation in in in, in our political leadership. Um, they understand that the discontent is something they they cannot control, and it's it's come to unmanageable proportions now um, for everybody. I mean, like America usually says, oh, yeah, we've got freedom of speech and everything else. But now they're silencing everybody. They're mm-hmm. shutting people down. Um, they know that Donald Trump, basically his whole entire presidential campaign began with him, um, uh, with the birther conspiracies that started before Obama took um, office, right. right? So he had a whole nine-year period where he was using Twitter to basically campaign for an election. And, they, and then he won the election, Right. And then he was the president and they couldn't take him off Twitter. And then he stayed as the president using his Twitter platform to only get bigger. And, you know, the last thing they want to do is give him Twitter again to use it to do what he did to Barack Obama, to Joe Biden and come back into office. So then they do the obvious thing, the only obvious thing they can do to stop him. Right, which is ban his account, which is obviously going to look like an overreaction and unfair to everybody. But guess what? 
they don't do. give a damn. Exactly. <laughs> but then, dude, don't you find it surprising how there's always, in, in history, there's always a South African involved. Jan Smuts with Churchill, World War One, World War II. Um, Elon Musk. Why, no, not what? only Jan Smuts, World War One, John Sherwood Kelly. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Churchill was going to bomb the Bolsheviks. He was going to gas them all. Mm-hmm. You understand what I'm saying? And I think the gassing happened elsewhere. Um, I, I don't know where in Europe the gassing actually ended up happening in, in World War One and 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 um, uh, um, well, they, they gassed a lot in World War One. Yeah, in, in the yeah, trenches. But, but just imagine, just imagine if the Bolsheviks were sworn enemies of the British because they were gassed. You know, I, and as South African uh, prevented that. But I mean, mm-hmm. you were going to list others. No, no. Well, I'm just thinking is that there's always um, we we've we create some very special people, you know, in this country. Well, in that country, because I'm not in that country right now. In well, our country. Well, yeah. But in our and, country, yeah. And, yeah, and I think it's it's a it's a, um, it's a function of the place. It's a function of the uh, education, and it's a function of the frontier mentality, probably as well. And it's mm. it's I just find it incredible how like a country that's far away from the seat of power generally, you know, manages to sneak people in. Well, think about it like this. What does it take to get to South Africa? It takes getting to the end of the earth. Mm-mm-mm. You understand? And only a few people can be able to get to the ends of the earth. And once those people gather at the ends of the earth, what emerges from them is, you know, a different type of people. And that's mm-hmm. why you find that you and your brother have been such conquerors in places with meeker temperaments, you know, um, and less tenacity and less drive, you know. Mm-hmm. Also, in South Africa... You know, um, there's somewhat of a certain belief that anybody could be like the next Nelson Mandela, the next Francois Pina, the next, you know, yeah. it's like, hey, man, it could be anybody. You know, that guy you're going to school with, yeah, he's going to be the next Trevor Noah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And you drive down Louis Bois and you see a post of Trevor Noah and you're like, he went to this school. And That's you see right. the kids that are there eating popcorn outside of school and you're like, yo, you guys, you know, are amongst greatness. Um, so that is one thing. But if you, if you look at it um, uh, as well, I mean, we also have two oceans that meet uh, where we are, you know. Uh, We also have Eastern and Western culture that collide um, at our ports, you know, and had done so for millennia until the Suez Canal, you know. Um, So, you know, I just think that where we are placed geographically uh, is not by accident because it allows us to be in tap with the winds of change globally mm, mm, mm. Um, because we have somewhat of, you know, a bird's eye view or a certain um, uh, purview of the world yeah. and how it works we, and we, how we relate to it. It's and, almost and like we're far we enough away. Yeah, we're almost, yeah. we step back and we can see the full picture because we have to because we're so far away. It's almost. like we're sitting at the kiddie, we're sitting at the kiddie's table. Yeah. If you go to the ki- <laughs> ki- if you seriously, if you go to the kiddie table and you ask them what's happening, they will tell you what's happening at every single table. Mm-hmm. Because what the kids do is that they sit there and they feel like, okay, fine, um, we've got no power to influence what's happening here. We, are, we you know, we just find ourselves here, but we can observe. Right. You know what I mean? And 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 and, and that's it. And every once in a while, the kid gets overexcited and gets onto the dance floor and shuts down the whole entire wedding party. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, and that's yeah. what South Africans are. <laughs> Dude, I think that is the best way, the best way to close this uh, conversation. Um, it was a real pleasure, my man. And uh, thank you for doing it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know if you want to plug anything. Tell us where you can find you. No, uh, no. Like, yeah, no. I, I'll find you when I come to Italy. If, if, you, if your family comes down for December, like, I mean, like, I know you came down last year, but we're really open, bro. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work. I'm going to work on it. I'm trying to get down there for sure. <laughs> Like if it's not if it's not Christmas, it'll be January, I think. But a hundred percent. But hey, January is still open, bro. We're exactly. open until April. <laughs> okay, dude. What's your Instagram? What's your YouTube? Uh, at La Vida Nota. I'm at La Vida Nota on YouTube, but I just comment on stuff. I don't really post there mm. yet, but I'll be posting as soon as short uh, monetizes um, in January. Um, at La Vida Nota. La Vida Nota. The life of Nota. You know, it's Latin, Fantastic. it's inspired, um, you know, I've got a lot of Italian connections because, you know, I just love the Italian culture and part of our township um, Soweto culture um, mm-hmm. was very influenced um, by um, I- Italian style, you know. Um, so even the name Nota, um, it comes from the Latin Nota Bena, NB, you know, 
and, and again. Uh, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yep. yeah, it's a note, you know, to note well. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm just looking forward to finally making uh, my first trip to Italy um, and being shown around. And uh, luckily, I've got a fellow um, uh, South African Italian uh, who's much are, more familiar. We are here. We are here whenever you want to come. Make sure you do. No problem. <laughs> cool, uh, my man. I'll bring, I'll bring my brother too because, you know, yeah. Absolutely. He's in love with fashion and in love with Milan culture. Dude, let's keep in touch and um, absolutely have some more conversations as well, you know, because I think we, no I have a whole list of questions that we didn't even get to, but I think that'll be good for the next time. This is really good, like to get our feet in the water, get to know each other a little bit instead of starting to fight about women's rights and uh, virginity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, let's, let's get up the next time. <laughs>